The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin McCabe, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Today's webinar is brought to you by representatives from Norway and is titled Approaching Final Investment Decision, CCUS Developments in Norway. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You might either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk for assistance by dialing the number shown on this slide, 888-259-3826. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type it in at any time during the webinar. Also, the recording of today's presentation will be added to YouTube at the link provided on this slide. Today's webinar is centered around presentations of a review recent developments by various organizations in Norway as they approach investment decisions on major CCUS projects throughout the country. Before we launch into the presentations, I'll provide a quick introduction of today's panelists. Then, following the panelists' presentations, we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. Before introducing the panelists, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Mr. Juho Lipponen, the coordinator for the Clean Energy Ministerial Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage Initiative, who would like to say a few introductory remarks. Juho? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, can you please just verify that uh, this is uh, that, that you can hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so my name is Juho Lipponen, and I'm the coordinator of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS Initiative. And I would like to also welcome you all to this webinar on behalf of the initiative and its and its members. And also many thanks in advance to our Norwegian colleagues for giving today's presentation and giving to you and the and the uh, NREL team over in in Colorado for getting up early to handle this arrangement and uh, and for running through this this webinar with us. Um, the CCUS initiative is one of over 20 work streams under the Clean Energy Ministerial or the SEM process. Uh, the SEM is in existence since 2010 uh, and has 26 full members across the world. Uh, the SEM member countries uh, make 90% of clean energy investments globally, but they are also responsible for 75% of global CO2 emissions. So this is a very re relevant uh, global partnership. Um, ministers meet once a year, typically end of May or early June, and the next Clean Energy Ministerial meeting will be hosted by Chile in May, June 2020. Now, in between these ministerial meetings, the work streams ensure the day-to-day -day advancement of various clean energy topics, including also carbon capture. And in our initiative, in the CCUS initiative, we have 11 government members uh, plus observers, and our common objective is to accelerate carbon capture together. And we do this because we believe that CCUS has a role to play as part of a clean energy portfolio, and because now is really time to to accelerate. And one of the activities is indeed these webinars where we disseminate information on key projects and government programs, such as Norway, uh, that we'll be talk about, talking about today. Uh, we will, in the future months, uh, continue this webinar series <clears throat> and, and we'll uh, keep you informed. We have several interesting country cases to bring to you from China, the US, the Netherlands, Japan, the European Commission, etc. So stay tuned for the announcements uh, for the next uh, next webinar. And I hope you all will all, all enjoy uh, this presentation. And uh, as Kevin said, do use the dialogue function, the question function in the system 
to send in your questions uh, uh, at the end of the presentations. With that, back over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Great. Thank you for those remarks. Uh, this is certainly an exciting time to be a part of this initiative. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First up, we have Christian Miske, who is the Assistant Director General for the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy of Norway. Christian has worked in the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy since 2006. She worked four years in the oil and gas department in the ministry, where her responsibilities included a portfolio of oil and gas fields on the Norwegian continental shelf. Infrastructure development on the Norwegian continental shelf and ownership in the Norwegian gas transport system. Following Kristen will be Oli Martin Mo, project manager for 42 Maslow Varme. Oli graduated as a civil engineer in marine engineering from NTH, now NTNU. He has enjoyed a long career in the shipping and offshore industries and has been fortunate to be involved in many interesting projects, both as project engineer and project manager. Says Oli, the most exciting projects are those that can take us a step further and provide good solutions to small and large challenges for our customers and society. After Oli, we will hear from Per Brevik, the Director of Alternative Northern Europe. Per has a master's degree in business administration from the Norwegian School of Business Administration, NHH. Since 1993, he has worked with alternative fuels development in the cement industry. From 2007 onwards, he has been responsible for alternative fuels, climate, and sustainability at Heidelberg Cement in Northern Europe. He has been responsible for the carbon capture project at Norsum Brevik since the launching of the project in 2011. Finally, we will hear from Svere Johansen Overa, project director for Northern Lights Equinor. Svere has been managing large investment projects for Equinor for the last 20 years. He was project manager for TCM, Technology Center Mongstead, in the design and construction phases from 2006 to 2012 before moving to Brazil and heading up Equinor's portfolio of modification projects there. After returning to Norway, he spent two years as deputy project director at the Nahimna expansion project for Orman Lange, one of the largest oil and gas modification projects in the world at that time. In 2016, he returned to CCS where he became project director for the Northern Lights project, a key element of the Norwegian state's full-scale demonstration project. And with those brief introductions, I'd like to welcome Kristen to the webinar. So hello everyone. Is this working? Good, thank you. So uh, I'm so delighted to give this presentation on the Norwegian full-scale mm -hmm. CCS project. This is an interesting project to work on and also a very, um, different way of working in the ministry. So uh, what I'm going to tell you uh, today is um, the status of our project and 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 um, how we work on CCUS developments in Norway. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, as you all know, CCS is a necessary part of the solution to reach a low carbon society. And this has been stated by the IPCC. Uh, it is important due to the Paris Agreement and also the World Energy Outlook, which came out today, also uh, shows the importance of CCS and the importance of developing CCUS solutions. Uh, and if we are to reach the sustainable development goals, we need uh, energy for all. And, and for that to happen, we do need to develop CCS solutions. So this is the background for the Norwegian government's engagement in CCS. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the Norwegian CCS strategy was, uh, was presented uh, back five years ago in 2014, and it has a broad approach. We support R&D uh, through um, our R&D program called CLIMID. Uh, we have different research centers, so there's a huge um, R&D community working on CCS in Norway. In addition, we have the Technology Center at Mongsta, where you can test uh, different uh, carbon capture te technologies um, at the site with extensive measuring. So that is an important part of demonstration of the different technologies and to develop uh, the technology and reduce costs. And finally, we have the large scale uh, solutions that is needed to 
to uh, reduce costs uh, and develop the CCS technology. And I'm going to tell you more about how we work on the large scale project going forward. So if you take the next slide, please. The current political platform of the Norwegian government states that they have an ambition to realize a cost-effective solution for full-scale CCS in Norway, provided that this incites technology development in an international perspective. And our aim for a CCS project in Norway is to demonstrate a full chain of capture, transport and storage of CO2, that it works, that it's flexible, um, and that we can actually capture CO2 from existing uh, industry. And then we want to establish a flexible storage solution with excess capacity. And, and the gentlemen in the room here, Pierre and Sverre and Ole Martin, they will tell you more about how to do this later on in the webinar. In addition, we want to provide cost and risk reductions for subsequent CCS projects. And that is also a very important part of the project. So how it looks is that we have two different capture sites. Uh, one here in Oslo at a waste incineration waste to energy facility uh, where they will capture 400,000 tons of CO2 per annum and it's owned by Fortum Oslo Varme which is part of the Fortum group uh, and also owned by the Oslo municipality. And then we have Norsem owned by the Heidelberg Cement Group which uh, has cement production also on the eastern part of, of Norway. It's cement production, 400,000 tons of CO2 per annum. And then the CO2 will be compressed and shipped to uh, an online terminal outside of Bergen, uh, where it will be uh, put on tanks and then it will uh, be transported through pipeline to an offshore storage complex. And so I will tell you more about that later on. So take the next slide, please. So we have worked on this project since 2014-15. Uh, and, and we have uh, done it step by step through an industrial project development phase. So we are currently in the very final stages of the feed phase, front end engineering design. The different industrial actors have handed in their feed report um, and they are currently being evaluated by our um, Crown Corporation, Gasnova SF, on behalf of the ministry. And then uh, we will have a quality assurance of those reports um, and also uh, of the negotiations on commercial terms for investment and operation that is going on between the government and the different companies. Uh, and then there will be an investment decision next autumn. And, and the way this is, is that the, the um, companies, they will make their investment decisions first, and then the government will propose to uh, the Norwegian parliament <coughs> how uh, in, in connection with the budget process for 2021. So then it will be decided whether or not the project will be financed, if it will be one or two capture projects and how, um, and how to take this project further on. So that will come next fall and we are very uh, excited about this process going forward. These are interesting times. So if you take the next, and, and if we make all this and everyone make their investment decisions properly, then we will be in operation in 2024. If we take the next slide, please, uh, you see here um, a web page called ccsnorway.com, which is uh, a web page where you can get all the information that you would want on this project. It's uh, operated by Gosnova SF. So with that, I think uh, I'll leave the floor to Ole Martin, and then he can tell you a bit more about the Fortum uh, project and how they are doing that please so next slide um, uh, um, my name is Ole Martin Mo and I'm the project manager for uh, Fortum Oslo Varmes uh, CC project at Clemensrø in Oslo um, as Christian says we are owned by Fortum and uh, Fortum is a leading energy provider uh, in terms of electricity and district heating within their markets and for them is very focused on changing uh, the energy systems from uh, 
from um, fossil um, sources to cleaner sources and also increasing the energy efficiency. So take the next slide, please. As we have said, the Fortum Oslo Army is owned 50% by Fortum and 50% by City of Oslo. And the main business of Fortum Oslo Army is to provide the district heating to the city of Oslo. And the main heat source for the district heating is the waste to energy plant at Clemensrud, just outside the city center of Oslo. And currently the plant incinerates approximately 360,000 tons of waste. Um, and the heat from the incineration is then used to district heating and also to electricity production. And we produce approximately 150 gigawatt hours per year from the waste incineration. The district heating network is uh, covering some 600 kilometers of district heat piping and providing uh, heat to some 3,289 domestic housing, 952 apartment buildings, um, 1141 commercial buildings, um, all in the city center of Oslo. Both donors have very high focus on reducing emissions and cleaner energy solutions. And City of Oslo have uh, renewed their climate strategy and have set a goal to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in 2030 by 95% compared to the 1990 levels. This is an extreme reduction in emissions and for the Oslo Warme carbon capture project for the waste to energy plant at uh, Glemsru is of uh, vital importance to reach those goals. For them, the other owner is likewise focusing on decarbonizing their energy production. The focus on carbon capture from existing power plants and renewable energy sources is among the drivers for the decarbonizing of the energy production. Fortum is a large organization with the majority of, of the operations in Northern Europe, but also operations in uh, Asia, uh, especially within uh, solar power plants. The Fortum organization is a total of 8,800 people. Uh, and Fortum Oslo Army is uh, selected as the center of excellence for the carbon capture within the Fortum organization globally. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the Fortum Oslo Army Carbon Capture Project at Clemenser have been through uh, the phases as uh, described uh, previously, the feasibility, the concept and the feed phases. And the goal is to uh, capture 400,000 tons of CO2 annually from the flue gas from the waste to energy plant. This is approximately 90 to 95% of the total emitted CO2 from the incineration. And it is a significant contribution to the planned emission reductions in city of Oslo. And uh, Clemens Lue as such is the largest point source of emissions in the city of Oslo. Incineration at Clemens Lue is mainly based on uh, municipal solid waste, which contains approximately 50% uh, of the biogenic origin. The CIS plant will capture both the fossil and the, and the biogenic CO2 and hence contribute to a net reduction in the CO2 in the atmosphere. <clears throat> the plant at Clemensory is located uh, approximately seven kilometers direct line from the port, which means that we need to, to transport the CO2 from the capture site to the export site, which will be at the port of Oslo. The transport is uh, decided to be done by trucks and we will have approximately 40 to 45 truck transports from Clemens route to Port of Oslo every day um, on a 24-7, 365 basis. The trucks will be run on uh, emission-free fuels. That means either biodiesel, bio gases. But when we, come, uh, when we come to the actual transport, we believe that also electric trucks with capacity of uh, transporting 50 tons will be available. And that is uh, the goal for the transport solution that we will use electric trucks for the transport. 
This will give um, important experience also for other CO2 capture plants, which are not directly located close to ports. The selected uh, capture techn technology have been uh, extensively tested at Clemenslue through a pilot plant, which has been specifically uh, tailor-made to um, replicate the full-scale conditions at Clemenslue. And the pilot has now been running for eight months, giving uh, a lot of uh, learnings and uh, demonstrating that the technology is mature and, and um, capable of capturing um, CO2 at the rate we have decided. The DMD GL have been used as um, a qualifier for the technology and they have given their um, statement of qualified technology for the shell capture technology used at the Clemens Through Waste to Energy through gas emissions. Shell capture technology provides more than 90% cleaning of the CO2, which also have been demonstrated by the pilot. This technology is also in use in other full-scale plants, although with different flue gas compositions. And Shell with their capture technology and Technique FMC with their strong project portfolio of flue gas cleaning projects are selected as the main suppliers to the FUV carbon capture project. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Waste is one of the world's biggest climate change challenges, and uh, about 2.2 billion tons of waste is produced every year, and this is uh, increasing. And poorly managed waste contributes to the global climate change through methane generation. The waste industry has a unique position and responsibility in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from waste. And uh, household waste, uh, municipal solid waste, counts for more than 5% of the total global emissions alone. And additional waste streams like industrial waste, agricultural waste, etc., accounts for additional emissions. The majority of the emissions is due to handling of the waste in open landfills without any gas collection system. The use of landfills has to be reduced by increased sorting and recycling in combination with efficient waste to energy plants. Waste to energy is most sustainable solution today for residual waste that cannot or should not be recycled. Carbon capture to the, uh, included in the waste to energy plants will further enhance the contribution to emission reduction in the waste industry. Uh, as previously stated, the um, municipal solid waste has normally a high content of biogen material, and such, as such, the waste to energy plants with carbon capture will contribute to negative CO2 emissions. The waste to energy industry will also contribute to solving increasing plant plastic challenges. The amount of plastic in the world is growing, even with increased focus on sorting and recycling. There will be still large quantities that cannot be recycled or have been recycled a number of times and is no longer possible to recycle. Waste to energy is the most sustainable way to treat those volumes. EU have, EU have set specific targets for moving away from landfills and towards increased sorting and recycling. Assuming that EU meets its targets, of 65% material recycling and reduction to 10% landfilling, a total of 142 million tons of residual waste will need to be treated. Currently, the waste to energy capacity in EU is 100 million tons, and new capacity of 40 million tons of waste to energy capacity will be needed to meet the targets. Combining the new waste to energy plants with carbon capture will have a major potential for global CO2 reduction. As one ton of CO2, one ton of waste is equal to one ton of CO2 capture. Other parts of the world will have similar challenges and even larger benefits from applying waste to energy with carbon capture. Based on the experience and knowledge from Fortimus Loarme, new waste to energy plants can be prepared for in the future, built with cost-effective cost-effective and integrated carbon capture facilities. I think that was um, my part of uh, 
the Fort de Moslo Warme Carbon Capture Facility. Okay, then we'll move on to Mr. Per Briavec, who will tell you about the capture project at Nusam Cement Factory. Yes, hello, this is Per Breivik. I'm uh, working for Nursem and Heidelberg Cement. And Heidelberg Cement is one of the main emitters in the cement industry. Altogether, the cement industry counts for five to eight percent of the total emissions, CO2 emissions in the world every year. And Heidelberg Cement on itself, we emit approximately 70 million tons of CO2 every year. And that's makes us having a responsibility to do something because we accept that climate change is a huge, absolutely a huge challenge. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, please. Cement is one of the main building materials in the world and maybe the biggest of everything. It's easy to form, it's durable and it has some negative effects on the cement, uh, on the climate change. But you can't imagine a society without using concrete. And especially when you're going to see a future sustainable society, it will be so important to have it. And when you look around in the world, you put a lot of efforts and resources in the world today to build infrastructure. And on the infrastructure side, you can't have very many other building materials can compete with them. So uh, if you are a really needed product, then we have a special responsibility to do something with it. And that's the way we are thinking in Heidelberg Cement and in Norsen. We have to do something. We have to con contribute to find a good solution. Next slide, please. And we, the way, the reason why it's so easy for us to, to, to say that, because is that the cement industry, we are quite easy for us to, to engage in carbon capture, et cetera, because we have some good sites that it's easy for us to, to be an active part in this. We are large stationary units. We are often big. Our, our emissions is in the, in the level of half a million tons per year up to two million tons per year. Then it's, you have a concentration and an easy way to do it, at least easier than for all the small emission sources. We are often clustered. So maybe we can do something together, different producer of cement, et cetera. And it, this is not only built for 10 years, it has a really long lifetime as a cement plant. The plants in Norway, they are more than 100 years and other sites, we know that they are 150 years. They are located to sea, close to sea very often. And as Christian showed us, that is important when you are talking about the Norwegian demonstration project, because sea transport is an important part of it. Then we have the fact that the reason why it's so huge emissions from the CO2 of CO2 from the cement plants is that two thirds of it is coming from the, the process where the limestone is split into C carbon dioxide and CO2. That's inevitable to do. We can't avoid it. Therefore, we have to do something to technology way to do that, to take it out of, the, of this uh, system only one third of it coming from the fuels we are using, which we work every day, try to reduce the CO2 emissions connected to the fuels. And this is a demonstration project which we are part of. Therefore, we also said, okay, to reduce the investments and reduce the operating costs, we try to, to, to really use the excess heat we have available in the cement plant. Then we can reduce the, the capex, etc. And the concentration in the flue gas is quite high, 20 to 24 percent. So we think it's a huge potential for us to work with this, and we have worked with this for a long time. And if you take the next slide, 
you can see that we have worked with it actually since 2005. And especially from 2011 up to today, we have been working with different, we are taking the small steps along the st ladder, and now we are close to the feed. We have delivered the, the, the feed study. We are, wait, we are in an interim period now, and we are waiting for a decision. Hopefully, we will be part of the, of the huge uh, full-scale project together with Fortum, together with Northern Light, etc. That would be a really good thing for the cement industry in general and for, for, for Norsen. Next slide, please. And here is a picture of what we are going to do. It's a demonstration plant. We are going to capture 400,000 tons per year, 55 tons per hour. And that's approximately 50% of the CO2 from the cement plant. The reason why we do this is, as I, as I tried to explain, is that we will use the, the excess heat. We will not have any energy source in addition to what we have in the plant today. We don't, don't build any new, new electricity plant or things like that. That's the one thing. The other thing here is that you see from the picture, everything with color, that is what we are going to build. And you can see, we are going to build a new plant at the same time as we are running the existing cement plant and to the, the, the requirement for us to produce 1.3 million tons of cement every year at the same time as we are going to build this new plant. That's the main challenge, really huge and maybe the biggest risk in the execution phase. So as you see, we are going to integrate it. That's a challenge, but we are sure we will make it and we will be the first cement plant in the world with a carbon capture plant. Thank you. Okay, so then we will move down uh, the value chain uh, to the transport and storage. And I'll leave the floor to Mr. Sverre Overo, who is the project director for the Northern Lights project. Thank you. So it's the Northern Lights project is uh, led by Equinor being the largest uh, oil and gas producer in, uh, in Norway. But we have teamed up with the two other major companies, uh, Shell and Total. So we're doing this as a joint effort. Um, all three companies have experience in storing of CO2, actually. And Equinor has been doing it uh, for the last 23 years. We've been storing more than 1 million tons every year in the North Sea. Uh, so, so that's kind of the background for why we believe we are a good team to, to bring this part of the project forward. So if you take the next slide. And this uh, illustration shows uh, the part that we are responsible for. On the left, you see a generic capture plant uh, representing Fortum, Norsem and others who may uh, come as, uh, as users of the storage. They are not part of what we are working with. Uh, our scope starts at, uh, at the seaside where we uh, bring in our uh, ships. They are part of our scope, the transportation scope. We believe uh, ships are a very good solution for the initial phase of CCS since it is flexible. It can go anywhere. There is uh, essentially uh, sea lanes and, uh, and harbors. Uh, it's suited for the size that we believe will be the initial size around 500,000 tons a year, uh, which is, it appears, uh, the size needed to demonstrate full scale, but still small enough, if we can use that word, to, to be possible to implement as a first step. Uh, later, there will be larger facilities, but I do believe that uh, most uh, industries and companies would like to see a demonstration working before they go to the really large scale. Following from the ship, uh, we then go to our uh, onshore facility where we essentially only temporarily store the CO2 uh, offloaded from the ship and then pump it out uh, through a uh, subsea pipeline directly out to the location where it will be stored. Uh, out there, the, there is nothing visible on the surface. Everything is at the seabed. Uh, the same technology we use for uh, subsea production of oil and gas and have a long experience with. Uh, 
Um, so it's essentially just uh, what we have been doing for a long time, but in reverse, using the same technologies and the same systems and solutions, uh, pumping then the CO2 down uh, thousands of meters into a geological formation suitable for storing of the CO2. Uh, the major part of the work actually is to qualify the storage site, the geological storage site, uh, to ensure that it is suitable in the sense that it has capacity and that it is uh, safe and that nothing will migrate or leak from that formation and back out to the surface and into the air again. That is the, the key uh, work that we're doing. Um, so the first phase of the project, if you look at the bottom of the illustration, you will see that we try to illustrate uh, capacities. Uh, so the initial phase of what we're doing is sized for more than the two initial Norwegian capture projects in order for us to actually start receiving CO2 from others. Uh, and we are seeing an increasing interest in utilizing that capacity from industries all over Europe. So that's very good, very positive. Uh, the bottleneck of our system is the pipeline. That's the least expandable part. Uh, therefore, uh, we will put in a pipeline with uh, significant excess capacity to allow us to scale up um, by adding a little bit more of extra hardware onshore uh, or add extra ships. That's easy and quite scalable. The pipeline then is, is our bottleneck. Um, five million is what we believe we can go and get through in this initially. Uh, and if we want to scale up from that, we need additional pipelines or other solutions. Um, but when we get there, then this is a success. So that will not be a problem to, to get in place. So if we take the next slide. And while we, just like the capture plants, have concluded our studies, uh, we're doing a little bit more. Uh, and what you see in this illustration is actually the hardware on the left that is needed to have an injection well in place uh, that was uh, constructed and uh, delivered to us uh, a month ago. Uh, and then it was installed uh, at the location where we intend to, to drill and have the first injection well. And it's currently sitting on the seabed uh, together with the fishes waiting for, uh, for the drilling rig to come. Um, and the drilling rig is scheduled to come uh, next week. Well, next month, sorry, which is almost next uh, week, <laughs> but a little bit longer. Uh, and then we will start drilling uh, the first well. And um, why are we doing this? Uh, before any decision is being made to, uh, to actually execute the project. Then if you take the next slide. What we, what we need uh, in order to document that we have a suitable storage site uh, is to document and show that we have the correct geological formation. There needs to be a sandstone with sufficient porosity uh, and permeability that allows us to inject CO2, that it will flow away from the well, uh, and that it will have capacity to receive CO2 from the capture sites for a long time. Uh, it also needs to have a seal uh, a cap rock above the sandstone that acts as a, as a barrier towards the surface and, and ensures that the CO2 stays where it should be uh, forever. Uh, and thirdly, it needs to have properties that allows us to monitor this from the surface because we can't go in there and this is 3000 meters below seabed. So we have to be able to monitor this through seismic surveys that show us where the CO2 is. Um, this is important both because we want to document that it is stable and that it stays there permanently, but also because if there are anomalies or something happens, we need to detect it so that we can do mitigations um, in order to avoid any uh, chance of leakage uh, of the CO2 back to the surface. Um, and we need this before we can make 
the necessary investment decisions. We don't want to start the project and then find this out later, which is why we're drilling it now to have that information in hand before uh, we ask the authorities to make the final decision. Thank you, Svelle. Then I think uh, we're, we've concluded the presentations from Oslo and I'll send over to you, Kevin, to, do, to lead us through the Q&A session. Yes, wonderful. Thank you to each of the panelists for those outstanding presentations. Um, as we shift to the q and I'd like to remind our attendees to please submit questions using the question pane at any time. Uh, we do have some great questions from the audience that we'll use the remaining time to answer and discuss. Um, one of the first questions that I received was uh, with regards to uh, the Fortum capture facility. Are there any thoughts on trying to capture far closer to 100% at the Fortum facility rather than just 90%? I think that... Um... Through our pilot testing, we have seen that we can capture 99%. There will always be some uh, some uh, leakage of uh, CO2 through the process. But I think um, having aiming at uh, 90%, 90 to 95% is still a high degree of uh, capture rate. But for a, for a demonstration project, I think that is, uh, is uh, suitable. Certainly, yes, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, a more broad question on financing. How do companies make their investment decision and risk evaluation without knowing if the government is going to support the project? What's the reasoning behind some of the timeline related to that decision process? I think I'll, I, I, I can start answering from the ministry side and then the different companies can follow up. I think from uh, we have stated from the beginning that the state will have to take a major part of the costs and risks in, in this project. But uh, from the government's perspective, it is crucial that we see that the companies actually put money into this because that's the important indicator that they actually believe in this as a climate solution. Because the government should not pick the winners when it comes to technology. That's up to the to the industries and the and the different companies to decide. So, so from our side, this is sort of we are or the government and the state is offering to to take most of the costs and risk in the project where we need contribution from the industrial actors to prove that this is uh, an important climate technology that the industry believes in and also uh, to, of course, to, to sort of as, as this is a, uh, a, a project that we're together in. Uh, and so from the government perspective, it is uh, crucial for us to know that it, when we make this uh, decision that will involve billions of uh, billion, at least a billion euros, uh, then it is important for us to know that the companies are actually in there. So, so this has been a prerogative from the state that the companies will have to make their decisions before the states make their final investment decision. That said, uh, we are currently in the final stages of negotiating the terms on uh, how to share the costs and risks so that the, the government, no, the industrial um, investment decisions are based on a knowledge of, so if this project comes through, these are the terms. So it's not like they're in uh, in full sort of, uh, they they will know uh, what the terms are if we have an investment decision. So, Sarah? Just uh, from, uh, from the perspective uh, of the transport and storage uh, partners, uh, we all see that uh, mitigation measures are needed to bring us to, to where we want to be with respect to, uh, to emissions. And CCS is one important tool in that toolbox. Uh, we believe it will become uh, a significant business over time. It's not today, uh, it's not in the near future, but it will. And we believe strongly enough in that, that we are willing to take a certain amount of risk um, together with the Norwegian government that, uh, that this will initiate that industry. Um, so uh, we go into this knowing that if 
it does not develop as we expect, then we will have a loss. Uh, so there is there is a risk that we will lose money on this. Uh, but there is also, and we believe, a higher probability that we will ultimately be uh, kickstarting a new industry that will become a business not very profitable i have to say but it will become a business and it's needed to be a business in order for it to grow uh, over time great thank you yeah. i sorry. think Pell would like to have some comments as well please yes i, I will follow up what christian said that we, this is a demonstration plant uh, or project and of course there are a lot of risks with it but we try both all parts of us we try to reduce the risk as much as possible but as we see and i think fortiman and uh, heidelberg is quite agree upon this that we have to take measures we have the responsibility to do that so if, as long as we believe we have done testing we believe in the technology we think this is possible to do then we go on and as christian said we are in the last phase of the negotiations about sharing of costs and and the and the, the terms we are working on etc i i'm sure we will find a solution and then it's up to the uh, to the higher higher part of our organization etc to accept this negotiation and uh, the results from the negotiations and the terms but of course we have our advice to our top managers is, let's go for it and i can just uh, from portum side i uh, agree to that um, we are in the final stages of the negotiations and this has already been raised by the board of Fortum and, uh, and the process is ongoing. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a question, I think specifically for Per, um, as you expect to use excess heat from the plant, um, what do you expect to be the main operating costs uh, for the project? I did, I'm sorry, I didn't hear <laughs> you have some... The main operating cost, if you ask us for that, the main operating cost for us will be electricity. And that's for, for the capture plant. That's the main uh, operating cost we have, we have for it. And uh, I think approximately 50% of the cost will be that. And uh, uh, we have a lot of electricity in Norway, but we have, it has to be built a new trans transformator, etc., for 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 the this plant because we we need quite much electricity to use. Great, thank you. We have a sort of related question: um, Is there any external financing required for any of these projects or work streams, uh, or or will these costs be self-financed? I think that uh, for all of us. If you call if you call the Norwegian state or the government external, then it's external financing. As Christian said, the main cost will be covered by the, the, the ministry and the Norwegian government. Great, thank you. Um, changing gears, uh, we have a question related to public support of the project. What is the status of public support, and do you have to deal with any considerations related to folks um, in Norway? Uh, perhaps not uh, on board with the project goals in general. Um, that that is a very good question. I have to say that in in Norway we are quite um, we are quite um, glad that we have a very broad support for this project. Uh, in the parliament, all the different parties are pro CCS, and they see this this as an important measure to combat climate change so so we have a very broad political support for the project when it comes to to local support uh, my impression is that there is also very much support locally close to the different um, capture projects and and uh, as opposed to what's the situation uh, other places maybe, uh, as the transport and storage part here is offshore in the North Sea, uh, we don't have very much of the sort of not in my backyard syndrome in relation to this project. So I would say overall, there's a lot of uh, support, public support for the project. And, and as far as I know, we haven't seen any opposition or, uh, or, um, 
people being against the project as such. And that said, I would also say that it's very important for us that we, in this project, deal with HSC uh, and, and the local um, communities in a very good way. Uh, and so uh, we have a very high focus on HSE in the project and to make sure that everyone is, of course, in line with all relevant regulations. So I think uh, we are very confident that this will work out fine. Great, thank you. Now, we have a couple of related questions here. Um, specifically, how is the government approaching some of the cross-chain risk or rather uh, how challenging is it is the integration of the various components of this chain um will the operation of the entire system be constrained by any single component perhaps the ccs portion um i think uh, from from the government perspective when we uh, we have some experience with projects in norway not going forward uh and and so when we started the this project one of the main um one of the first things we discovered was to de-link the capture from the transport and storage part. And that was due to the, um, the industrial companies telling us that we can do the capture, but you will have to take care of the transport and storage. That's the only way to go forward. Uh, and so that has been uh, the basis for this project from, from its very infancy, basically, that, that um, the um, interface risk between capture and transport and storage is for the stay. That implies that uh, the, the capture box is the capture box. And if there's trouble on the transport and storage part of, of the chain, then that won't inflict the capture part of the pro project and the other way around. So if there's a trouble at the capture sites, then that will not uh, inflict the transport and storage part financially. Um, and, and when it comes to sort of bottlenecks, or I think I will leave that to the uh, uh, industrial actors to answer. Do I any? I mean, uh, obviously, the, the storage uh, looks mm. like a bottleneck uh, if you see it from the outside, mm. because there is uh, a common uh, storage for. Uh, at least two, hopefully many more uh, capture sites. Uh, the way we are approaching that is that you should consider it as a service being provided and it is uh, the responsibility of the Northern Lights partners to provide storage. And if we need to develop additional sites in order to make that happen, then that will be part of the business development over time. Uh, not in the demonstration project, obviously, because that's kind of uh, everything is uh, one off since it's the first of a kind. But uh, once it gets going, there needs to be redundancy in the storage uh, solution being provided. And that is the plan. Yeah, I can, I, I can say from the cement industry, of course, the, the main risk, as I said, is that the, the, the capture plant compromised with the cement production. We are cement producers and that will, uh, will have the priority. But if it, all the testing, all, all, our, all, all our assessments say that this, will be, we, this is manageable and we have all, all of the systems, they are in parallel. So we can, we can stop the, the capture plant and then we can run the cement plant. And hopefully that will not make any huge problem. We are going to, to capture the 400,000 tons. We will manage that, I'm quite sure. Great, thank you. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we will have to move on. Uh, thank you again to the panelists for that informative Q&A session. Um, for any questions we didn't have time to get to, we will connect with those attendees offline after the webinar and forward any responses from the panelists uh, afterwards. Um, so in the final few minutes, I'd now like to provide the panelists with an opportunity to provide any additional or closing remarks you'd like to make before we end the webinar. I think from, uh, from my side, I would like to underscore that uh, from the government's perspective, um, this project is a success if it's the first of many CCS projects. What we don't want is this to be the last CCS project in Europe. And we believe that this is a, 
could be a good uh, basis for uh, development of CCS in, mm -hmm. in Europe. And that is a very important aspect for us. So when the government are to assess this project a little less than a year from now, that will be their main focus is, is this the first of many? Do we believe that this is the first of many CCS projects? And we certainly hope it is. And I can add that we have discussed this for a long time and uh, during different phases, etc. And I'm quite sure that the situation today is much better mm -hmm. than it was one year ago, two years ago, etc. The interest for CCS in the industry is much higher and better today. And I'm sure that a lot of interest plants, groups, etc. in the cement industry, they follow closely what's happening in Brevik. And if we manage to do this, this will definitely be the first in the row. I can just add to that, that uh, also in the waste to energy business, there has been a lot of interest lately. And also Fortum has different uh, energy plants where we now look into applying CCS for uh, those plants, both existing and new plants. And there is uh, a lot of interest when we have had the um, pilot up and running at Clemensru. A lot of waste to energy companies has been there looking at it. And someone is also wanting to uh, continue testing with our pilot in their plants. A lot of industry, and I'm sure that if this is a success, then it will be several more projects. And from our side, we have been discussing now essentially the, the scope of the Norwegian demonstration project, uh, but it has the component that it is also open for others outside of the Norwegian demonstration project, and we are seeing a lot of interest, which is good, uh, and other companies are joining forces, hopefully with us um, in not too, too long. Um, Christine mentioned that there was a web page for the total project. I would also like to do a little bit of a commercial for our web page because there is a northern like ccs.eu web page as well, which contains quite a lot of information about uh, what we're trying to achieve. And, and finally, I would just like to thank SEM CCUS platform for hosting this webinar and to give us the opportunity to tell you all about what we're doing on a, on a daily basis and of course that something that we are very engaged and, and proud of. So thank you very much for organizing this webinar. It's our pleasure. Thank you again. And if you want to learn more about the CCUS initiative, please reach out to Mr. Juho Lipponen at the email displayed on this slide. For other news and developments, follow us on LinkedIn by following the link displayed here uh, and also on Twitter at CCUSCEN. One more time, I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our expert panelists and to our attendees for participating in, in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return that there were some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future CCUS events. This concludes our webinar.